thank you and welcome everybody. I uh, many of you are uh, new to Touch itself. Don't worry. I mean, we are going to be mostly in the top world, so I'm not going to use much of Touch itself. So don't worry about that. And if you are new to programming per se, like uh, to text um, code, don't worry as well because we are going to go slow, cover the basics. Because the idea of this workshop is to build a strong fundament so you really understand what you're doing. Because one of the things that happens a lot when I do workshops for GLSL is that people know how to use it, but they don't understand what is going on behind the scenes. So they know how to copy and paste this here, and that works, but then why? So we're going to cover basics and, and have a strong fundament from where you can grow. And you can attend other workshops, like for example, the one we are going to have later this afternoon that is like same thing, but a little bit more advanced or the one um, Vincent has tomorrow that is like really advanced. Okay, so let's get into it. Uh, have a video to explain something. Like at the end of the day, everything that happens um, in the graphic card is a shader. That's the way you talk to the graphic card. That's the way you push pixels to the screen. Uh, so behind the scenes also, a lot of the stuff that is happening in Touch Designer is a shader. The, the thing is that it gets abstracted and we don't have to interface with that piece of code because it's abstract, it's um, C-based, it's a little bit hard to, to code. So what the, everybody does is create libraries around it and then another library and then you have the application. So you have Touch Designer, for example, that is based on OpenGL. And most of the tops, what they are at the end of the day is a shader inside, okay? So that's why we use shaders because um, the way to talk to the graphic card, the way to talk to the, to the metal itself. And GLSL stands for Graphics Library Shader Language. So that's why we call them shaders. And um, that comes from the um, old pipeline that was, um, have you seen Tron, the 1983 movie? You remember the statics, right? So there was this guy from New York and Berlin that won an Oscar for the graphics of that movie. What he did was write a shader that will add some noise to the textures. So things will stop to look like flat, like the video games before that everything was a flat color and it started to have some, some noise to it, some, some variation, some organic um, organicity to it, right? And he won an Oscar for that. So before that, the shaders were just to write some shades to be able to welcome to have on top of the um, of the lighting some shadows, right? That's why it's called shader language. And then I have a video that is very interesting that I show all the time, every time, and people love it because it's the difference between a GPU and a CPU. That's another concept we have to learn. We are going to learn basically two main concepts today. One is that parallel processing. Why is a GPU interesting to do some calculations? And the CPU is in, um, more interesting to do another kind of uh, calculations. That's one concept. And the second concept is uh, the for loop. Like what's a loop and why that's interesting for shaders. Okay, so if you learn that two things today, I'm, I will be really happy. So uh, talking about uh, CPU versus GPU. So a CPU is um, like a fast um, machine. Like, you know, a computer can do uh, things really fast. Like they, they can add numbers really fast. Like you heard this uh, four gigahertz. So that means can do one thing really, really fast. And then we have the GPU that is a little bit slower, but can do many of those things at the same time. So when you hear the new 2080 has, I don't know how many CUDA cores, that means 
they have many um, uh, cores inside that they can do instructions all at the same time. That comes from the idea of uh, we have to push pixels to the screen. And we have to push them all at the same time, many times per second, right? So to do that, we have to um, push 1920 by 1080 pixels 60 times per second. So that's a lot of um, information that a CPU cannot do, literally. They could do one pixel really fast, but <laughs> not that many. So that's shaders, the basics. And then I have this video to, sh to show that that I'm telling you, but in a, in a visual way, because at the end of the day, we're visual. So whatever I'm telling you, you have to see to really. I don't know if we have sound. Do we have sound? OK, all good. We don't need the sound anyway. I can, ex I can explain it to you what is happening. So that's a CPU. So you can throw one pixel at a time. And it's making an image, right? So you, <laughs> you draw one at a time, and it makes an, um, a smiley face. And now they recreated a GPU that I can do many pixels all at once. So that will be your frame buffer, your vector buffer before, all of that, but don't worry about that. The concept is, is that, that you feed at the same time many, many, many um, pixels. And they do it in a very American way and very big and everything, but yeah. <laughs> Boom. There you go. <laughs> Slow mo, of course. But you, you, you got the idea there, right? What we want to do is um, have an array of elements that we can paint, that we can give a color. That's what they're doing. They have an array on, of X and Y. And for each of the elements, they're going to give a color. This, this is a paint color, but um, we're going to use RGB, right? It's the same. And then we push them all at once. So that's a, the first uh, thing to note about shaders. We are working in the whole buffer at the same time. That's a little bit of a change in mind that you have to do. Don't worry, we'll come through the day. But that's a very, very important step. We are working in every pixel at the same time, OK? So let's get started then. Um, touch, right? Mm -mm -mm. Do you have it all open? Open touch, and you can delete everything from the template. That's all fine. And then we're just going to add a top called GLSL. If you don't know how to open the op create, you can hit tab on your keyboard or double click in an empty area of the network. And then you can type GLSL. And we have two of them. We're going to use the first one, GLSL. Can you read the text from there? Yeah? OK, cool. OK, so that's what we got. We got a top and two dots. Well, there's three, but for now, we are going to forget about the third one. So we have two dots. One is an info that is going to tell me um, how it's going with the, with the shader. For example, now we got three results straight. That is, the vertex shader is compiled successfully. The pixel shader is compiled successfully. And the link with the program is also a success. Uh, we're going to focus on pixel shaders today. 
<clears throat> because they are a little bit easier to understand. But everything that we are talking, they apply to vertex shaders as well. I have an image to um, um, illustrate what I'm saying. Um, ah, do you see a little bit? You don't need to read. So this is the uh, old pipeline that what was called the fixed pipeline that has many steps, but there were two shaders that you could write. The vertex to apply to vertices, every vertex of a 3D model, and the fragment, that will be every pixel in the image. And in between there will be some processes, the rasterization, the, um, the triangle ensemble, assembly, sorry. But we don't care about that. That was happening in the OpenGL side, and we didn't have any control of that. We could write some shader to modify the position of vertices or the normals, that kind of stuff. And then we had a fragment shader that we now call more pixel shader than fragment, but it's the same thing. That was to, to manipulate the pixels in the screen or in the image in general. And that uh, changed, and now we have some more complex structure, but don't worry about that. Let's focus on them. So that's, where, that's why we have here vertex shaders successfully compiled, pixel shaders successfully compiled. And what we have here is what we are going to work with is the um, pixel shader. You can see here down, GLSL1 underscore pixel. I'm going to make this, um, this top my background so we can see it all the time with this little flag display. So it will be in the background. Okay, and if I turn uh, my dad active, I can write code on it. So first thing um, you have to notice is the main function. That's where everything is happening. That's what gets triggered uh, once per frame, right? So everything that's happening here will happen once per frame. And here comes the second um, um, concept that we said today. Everything that happens there happens per pixel. So that's why now we have all the pixels in white in the image, right? Because every instruction that we uh, create inside the main function, it goes execute per pixel. So it's all of them. What, uh, the same instruction per every pixel, right? So if we say pixel go white, that's what's happening here in this line. The color is one, meaning the color is white. We, all, we are going to work from zero to one. Zero means black most of the time, one means white most of the time. So if we say vector color B1, then all of the pixels are why? So let's change that quickly and make uh, make it orange. Sorry, that should be zero. Uh, yellow, sorry. Do you understand that step? What happened there? The last, ah, okay, yeah. We go one by one there. So what we are doing is changing one instruction, but it happens for the whole image, right? So what I did was, um, as you see, there's here an out. Let's forget about this for, for a second. I'm going to delete it. The first line that is important is this one that says out back for frag color. Okay, so what we are telling there to the um, to touch is that we are going to give you four values, four float values packed into a vector. 
don't be scared by the word vector. It's just a packed um, amount of four values into one entity. So vector four, frag color. That's going to be my output. And then inside the main uh, function, I can tell which color is going to be, which value is one of uh, each of those um, floats in the vector four. That's why when I say col color, sorry, I can write them individually. So if you take red out, we have only green. If I add full blue, then I have cyan. And if I have uh, 0 0.5, then I have uh, this green that looks really weird on the projector. Say it again. <laughs> so that's the basic entity we are going to work with, a color, right? Because we are, we are pushing pixels to the screen. So what we want to give as an output to touch, to, for touch to be able to draw anything is colors. And right now, we are going to, we are giving every single color, every single pixel the same color. Right, because there's no way right now to to get where am I in the picture. Okay, and so the second concept here, I'm going to step out for a second and put that. Um, for some of you who knows programming, this might be familiar int equals zero, uh, y less than amount of whatever, um, i plus plus, right? Do you know what's happening there, everybody? So when we go, that's another thing. That's not a uh, shader language. Well, it is, but forget about it. I'm just talking about programming in general. So we have a loop. So we have some instructions here uh, that happens before. So it's like uh, break an egg. And then there's uh, some other instructions that is um, put egg into pen. And then we have a loop, meaning whatever is happening here, um, scramble. That will happen many times, as many times as amount tells, right? So what is happening is these instructions get executed, then we go to this one, and then we do a scramble. How many times? We cycle, right? As many as amount, and then we got out. Do you understand that, that idea? It's very simple, right? It's like we are going to repeat the thing. But then we have this guy, i, that we can use inside the loop. So if we output i, um, well, I'm not doing any real programming. But if i will uh, be 0 at the beginning, because we tell here i is 0, and then we add 1, so i1, i2, i3, together. So inside our loop, we can access the iteration. That's what the I stands for. So we know where we are in the loop. So that will be um, how we can use, um, we can change different pixels to have different values. Because we're inside a loop. We, we will have access to every pixel independently knowing their coordinates. So that's the, the second concept. A shader is a loop. But you don't have to write the 4i because you are already inside. So the main is just the, the, um, the part that is inside of the loop that goes through all the pixels. Right? I, I, will, um, I will repeat that through the morning a lot, OK? You will get into your head at some point. And that is. Uh, given to us by touch designer. So before, when we were in the loop, 
this i was given outside of the loop to the inside. And we could use i for whatever reason. We could know which uh, iteration we're at. Touch is going to give us as well which part of the, meaning which pixels we are at. And we are going to change the color. So this is this variable here that is given already. It's called VUV. And ST is a standard for textures, but uh, it can be also XY, whatever. We'll look into that later. So uh, let's do a quick, very quick visualization of that. Um, Okay, look at the code and look at the, um, the image behind. Before we had one value that was one that was uh, absolute for all the pixels. Now we're changing that value to a, a, para a yeah, parameter variable, sorry, um, that changes. How does it change? It gave us the position of the pixel. It's similar to the eye that we had in the loop. VUVS is telling us where this pixel is in the X position, right? That's why from up to down doesn't change. From left to right, it changes the value. So VUV dot s changes from 0 to 1 from left to right. It's looping, and every time it moves a pixel, it adds 0 0.00 whatever. Yeah? Touch designer. Yeah. Yeah. Questions there, because that's a very important step, <clears throat> and I don't want to go farther if it's not clear. I mean, we will, we will incide on it, and we will repeat it, but questions? Uh, because it's red, because I'm putting it in, in, the, in the red channel. Very good. In the red channel of my color. If I put it as well in the green channel, copy and paste, then I have a yellow. The same way as before, we said one, one, zero, that was yellow for the whole screen. If I use a variable, variable um, that changes with the position of the pixel in the X coordinate, then we can use that one, right? Yeah, the maximum is 1.0. I mean, it's not a maximum. You can go beyond, but we cannot see it in a pixel. You can use it for something else. Don't worry about that. But as a pixel, we can just show zero as black and one as full of the channel. You can go beyond or below. We will, we will see that in a second. Yeah? So, yeah. So the four, say it again, the four values of color here are going to be R, G, so red, green, blue, and alpha. Let me write it. Uh, red, green, blue, bl blue, and alpha. Right? Okay. Um, can you, all of you, do the same, but uh, that the gradient is from zero at the bottom to blue at the top? 
black at the bottom, blue at the top. Just try for a second. And take a look at, at what it was here already and what I'm using, right? Uh, blue, well, choose your color, but. Yeah, does it make sense? So what I'm doing, oh, well, let me do it as well. So zero, zero, V, U, V, dot, T, one. OK? So that's um, um, something that is special to GLSL that is not common to have is a swizzling. You can just take a value. As we said, uh, there's this vector force that's just a package of four values together. And you can access them individually by just writing dot and then the value that you want, right? And a trick here, T, well, no, not in this one. Yeah. Let's make something. Back to, I'm going to declare my own uh, coordinate system. OK? So I'm going to say that vector V, vector 2 UV is going to be equals to what we already know, that is VUV dot ST. So I'm just changing the name there. I'm going to have another name that is easier to type for whatever reason. And we are going to do a trick with that. So now, instead of buv.t, I can write uv dot, and here is the funny part, x. Right? So I'm going to write that down, the Swissling. That's a funny word. Swiss equals, uh, this is a command. Um, so we have, uh, for example, we saw already ST, but we also have dot RGBA. And we also have dot x, y, z, w. What does that mean? I'm saying something weird here. So uv dot x is the same thing as writing uv dot r. Didn't change. That's exactly the same thing. Why? Because those are only aliases for the package of uh, values that is a vector for. Right? I could do as well this, which is a weird one, but you could also do that, meaning the first value in the package that is zero. Why will, will we have that? Because it's easier to read. Like when we are talking about the UVs, we are talking about the coordinate of the pixel in the image. So if I call it R, it's not going to be so intuitive for my head to think about a coordinate. I'm going to think about a color. But then when I write colors, I don't want to think about uh, what's, what was W. Now, if I write A, stands for alpha, then I know exactly what I'm writing. But this is the same value. It's the same point in the, um, in the package. Is everybody there? OK. So now we're going to recreate the famous UV um, image. There is this one, uv.x for the red channel, uv.y for the uh, green channel. And you've seen that, right? 
at some point, working with graphics, you've seen that image. What does that mean? Why, we, why is it useful? Why people still use it? Well, that's because that image packs our coordinate system. If you ask um, a pixel in that um, image its value, it will tell you where it is at the same time, right? So that's the inverse of where we we're thinking right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's all correct. Uh, it can be, it can be uh, if you are in the last version of Touch. Uh, there's a little bug with Sublime. Oh, the latest version. Yeah. Yeah. You are in the latest, right? I am. Yeah. There's a little bug that is disconnected. You can close Sublime and open it again, and it should work. Yeah. Um, meaning. A pixel that is black, full black, is located at zero, zero. A pixel that is full yellow, in this case, is located at one, one. Because our values changes from zero to one in X in the red channel, from zero to one in Y in the uh, green channel. So if you see in this toner, for example, in the palette, it uses um, one image like this to reposition pixels to do mapping. So it just looks up which color um, the, um, the image has, and then it can tell, okay, that, that means that this, pos this pixel should go there. I know that this is very abstract right now. It will get a little bit more fun in a second, okay? Everybody's with me? Any questions? Um, do you wanna try to make it a little bit nicer? Like for example, the black in the other corner and in the bottom left, instead of um, yellow, there is white. You want to try that? And then I go around. There's no reason for it. That's just a convention. Because you, ha you are in X, Y coordinates, so you don't need a third. Yeah. Um, but for this example, if you want to, if we want to go from black on the top right corner to bl uh, white on the bottom left, you have to use the blue channel because you cannot get white just with red and green, right? You need the three. But I want black on that side, okay? You have a compilation? Yeah, good. Yeah, this one that we are calling color, they represent the color of the pixel, meaning RGBA, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we are painting with red the positions. Yeah, yeah. So we are saying if my position is zero, I'm not going to paint any red, but if my position is one, I'm going to paint full red. Yeah. G, green. So you have it there. 
look in the in the screen. Dot RGBA is the same as dot XYZW. Yeah. So I'm going to do that one quick. I see all of you are. It's okay. Yeah. Cool. I see all of you are following, so that I'm really happy about that. Say it again. White. We're going to do it on the top, on the bottom left. So what I'm doing, for example, I'm going to do this one. One minus um, x. So I'm inverting the range. One minus um, UV uh, Y, so I'm inverting that range. I already have black on the top, um, right? And then for the blue, I'm going to copy one of these. Doesn't matter which one. Well, it matters, but I'm going to get a different result. So that's one way of doing uh, the exercise. Yeah. That will be one way. And that's something you do a lot. So when you want to draw, because what you can access is the coordinates of the pixels, what you do is changing the coordinates. You have to think a lot in that way in GLSL that is changing the world instead of changing yourself. So you move around the coordinate system. And then you paint and you put it back if needed. Right? That's an, a little change of um, of uh, way of thinking as well, right? But till now, how's it going? Is everybody, it's good, yeah? You wanna go faster, slower, it's all good? Okay, yeah, cool. So um, right now what uh, we have been doing is just color pixels based on their positions, but that's, I mean, that's okay, but it's not, very interesting till now because we just did gradients, right? So we're going to do something else. That is start to apply another functions that are already built in and that we can play with. And for that, always an LFO or a sign, it's always a good idea. So for example, I'm going to declare a new variable. I'm going to call it uh, whatever. We're going to be very stupid here. My sign is equals to sign of whatever, three sine of P, right? If I assign, I'm going to comment this one out, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, I'm going to leave that one there, I'm going to use a new one. That is going to be my sign zero, zero. Okay. So the sign of three point, so the sign of pi is zero, right? So that's why I have black. If I do the sign of one, I have red. Yeah. But I have, I didn't use my eye my iteration, my where am I in the, in the texture, in the image. So I'm just giving the same value for all the pixels. Does that make sense? So now if instead of that I use um, the sign of my UV dot X, the pixels will change depending on where they are located, the color of the pixels. Right? Um, do you remember the sign? Let me... I know this is... Um, you remember the sign, right? So what we are seeing here is this section. 
right? It goes from zero to one in a very smooth fashion. It's not linear that as we had before, you see that there's more red than before because it's going very smooth here and then how can we show instead of this area, this whole area? Say it again. We can use the same one and just multiply because uv dot x goes from zero to one. We want to expand that range until pi. So now we are seeing that range here. This is um, one and this is pi. Sorry for that awesome drawing. <laughs> okay, let me take it out. So yeah, that's the tricky uh, part of it. You have to think very mathematical because at the end of the day, that's what you're doing. You want to go from touch designer that gives you all the abstraction, all, all the nice stuff. You don't have to think in math. You can focus on design or whatever you're doing. But now we are going down the rabbit hole. We are going very close to the metal, very close to the graphic card. So now you have to think more in terms of math and less in terms of, uh, well, not less, but you have to translate. You don't think, I mean, you, you think, I want to do a gradient, a nice one. How do I do it? Well, there's a sign function. Then you type your sign function. So there's, that's this little change of mind as well that you have to do while writing shaders that is thinking, how do I write uh, this? How is this um, working? Yeah? So, um, how, how will be if I want to have instead of um, this area, if I want to have this area? Like two of these, basically. How would you do that? Say it again. Exactly. Two times what I wrote. Yeah? Thing is, this is zero. So we are seeing here values that goes to minus one, but we cannot represent them. Because minus one goes below zero, we cannot show pixels darker than black. It would be nice to have like a, I don't know, some kind of goggles lenses that we can see like infrared or whatever, and then we show that, but no, we don't have it. So a trick I'm going to do is show you the next function that is absolute. The absolute value of whatever. Absolute, what, is, what it does is if I'm below zero, it will give me the same thing but positive. Yeah? And now I say four, four lines. Eight, eight lines. And you already see what I'm getting at. Right now, this typing eight, four, three, that's not um, very, um, how to say, interactive. So there's, of course, a way to talk to this piece of code from Touch Designer in the same way that they are giving us the uh, ST values, so the position. There's a way for us to give arbitrary values to the shader. Okay, so let's do that. Here up, so I'm declaring, uh, well, I'm going to leave that close to the main. 
and we saw we're declaring um, the variable name, how I'm going to use this value, the type of value, this is a package of four together, and then special words. So this one out means this is my output. But then there's another one that is uniform. It's a weird one, but yeah. That means it comes from above. It comes from the application. Uniform float, I'm, I'm going to call this one frequency. Meaning there's a number, there's a variable coming from touch that I will be able to use inside my code in the shader, right? But how do I give that? How do I connect those? Now they are declared, but how do I connect them? So if you go to the parameters, if you press, uh, if you select the GLSL top, and press P, you get to the parameters and in vector one, vectors one, sorry, uniform name, you can declare something there. So if we type exactly the same word, frequency, now this value, 0 0.5, is something I can use in my shader. So let's go inside our shader, and this thing here that we call, that was until now eight or three or whatever you type, we can now change it from touch designer. So I call it frequency, now it's connected, I have a value of 0 0.5, but if I change this one, Now I change the number of uh, bars that I have. If I connect a chop, uh, for example, an LFO, and make this a little bit slower, and connect it. Yeah? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. An integer into the vector, you you don't need to cast that one. Yeah, no. There's some casting. I don't use integers. That's the easiest way. All the world is floats, yeah. I mean, sometimes you need, in very specific cases, like loops, the... Um, the i of the loop, like the iteration, has to be uh, an integer. But there's few exceptions. For uh, As a rule, I don't use integers. Yes, I'm coming to you. I'm going to make this one a little bit, um, yeah. Yeah, you see. Uh, uh, um. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have your info? Oh. Ah, I lost it. Sorry. So, again. There's an info that uh, I'm having. Yeah. In the top, if you select the top. Uh, yeah, yeah, pl uh, place an info that, uh, not the top, but the that, the last one in the, yeah, exactly that one. And then if you drop, no, you can just exactly drop it, the whole thing inside, yeah. Now you can check inside what is the issue. That's the vertex? shader but then you have also the a little bit down inside the um, the dot the info yeah exactly okay. okay now use of undeclared identifier uv that's our main um, our first problem so uv is not has not been declared yeah vector 2 so you just type back to uv no you can yeah, now is it clear? Uh, oh, nice, nice one. That's um, random access memory, basically. So you're just getting garbage from the graphic card, but it looks cool. It's cool looking 
Ja. Ja, säg vidare. The um, the next thing will be you declare it. The next thing will be to also assign a value. So you say vector to uv is equals equals to that one v uv dot st. So you like, yeah uv. No, you can just say uv equals yeah exactly v uv dot st. And I think the v is um, is a capital letter. Yes. Questions on this side? No, all good? Yeah. Tell um, me. It's not sliding, but I have the LFO and then I sit down. Yeah, but you have it, but right. you are not using it anywhere. Where do you use it? I'm using it to, to drive this number. Instead uh, of right. Yeah, instead of eight, I'm going to give a, a an, okay. yeah. What are you doing? So it's telling you on the find variable, uh, I think it's color. So if you, I know, color is the sign. There's one uh, variable that is not declared, and I think it's UV. Yeah, oh, right. Okay. So you have to tell it what's UV. Yeah, make it active. Yeah. Okay. Um, Everybody's happy? What would you say is the difference between using like a ramp top and using your own DLSL in terms of speed? Uh, no. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no performance gain there. For real, I mean, yeah. Is it literally DLSL? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a bigger shader because there's many options there and stuff. So you have you have pre uh, pre compile uh, defines and things like that. But yeah, basically the same. Okay. So one thing all of you notice is that it goes from left to right. So it's anchor at the left, right? Why is that? Because we saw that zero. Is on the left in our part, in our um, coordinate system, and one is on the right. So it will always go from zero to one, expanding that way, right? If we want to make it a little bit more uh, pleasant to the eye, what we need to do is move, as we said before, our our coordinate system. We are not moving the object itself because the object doesn't really exist. So what we are moving is the coordinate system. Right? So one way of doing that is telling my UV to move. So my uh, drawing, my sign is going to keep in the same way, but I'm going to move my world, right? So how can I do that? If we think about it for a second, I mean, this is something uh, at some point you forget because you do it so much, so many times that you forget about it. So I'm going to explain. We are in zero. Uh, let's focus on the X. We are going from zero on the left to one. But we want the zero in the center. How do we do that? Um, if you divide, then you are making it smaller, right? But we zero is going to be at zero. So there's two main, um, well, there's main, but uh, multiplication applied to a value. What you're doing is scaling. Division is the same. It's scaling, but on the other direction. So if you multiply a number by two, this is what we did before by eight, you get a bigger range. That's a scale. And then you have an offset that's adding of or subtracting if you have zero and you add one to that, you move it to the left, right? So what we are going to do is tell uv to be equals to uv times two, meaning now we go from zero to two, and then minus one. You see this in shaders all the time. I mean, I have it by default. It's just always there. And what that does 
is moving the coordinate system. So I'm going to go again here and delete all of that. How do you do that? Yeah. Um, so before this was zero and then we had one. Now I'm multiplying by two, so I'm going to two and then I'm um, offsetting. So what I have right now in my screen is this. This is zero. Holy shit, I'm so bad at this. Um, right? So now we're expanding from the center. Why is it working with the sign? Because the sign has the sa it, it, is the same in the negative uh, side of the spectrum. Some other functions, they don't work like that. In the negative side, they, they, they have no values, for example, or whatever. We are also using the absolute. So we are telling to copy the positive side to the negative side of our coordinate system. Yeah? Okay. Let's do a, we call this one my sign. Let's do another one of the same. <clears throat> Copy, paste, and I'm going to call this one my cosine. And of course, it's going to be the cos instead of the sin. And I'm going to put that one into the blue channel. But the cosine, I'm going to change it actually to y. Oh, yeah, sorry. So I just copy my sign. This is my main line of code. This is the one that is drawing uh, or is creating a shape that then I, I colorize, right? So I'm creating a shape that is not red, it's not blue, it's just a shape, it's a float, and then I'm putting that into my color somewhere here to colorize it. So I'm saying that red is going to be equals to my sign, the green is going to be equals to zero all around, and blue is going to be my cosine. But then I can start to get um, creative here, and that's the creative coding part of it. Uh, I can do that red is my sign times my cosine. I don't know what exactly is that doing. I'm not thinking right now about it, but I can just type and check. That's the creative coding, right? You don't know what, is, what you're doing, but let's see. Or I can divide. And I'm going to make my, this a little bit slower. Yeah? And then I feel that I need to add some variation because it's very equal on the whole uh, thing. So to my green, I know two tricks right now. I know how to do a cosine, I know how to do a gradient. So I'm going to use the other trick that I have that is a gradient to drive my... Um, green channel. So my green is going to be a gradient. But I don't know, this is a design choice here. It's going to be the other way.
Yeah? Does it make sense what we are doing? We're just learning a couple of tricks to draw cool things on the screen, one by one, based on the trick that we learned before. Okay? And at the end of the day, that's all what we have is a couple of tricks on the slate. Um, what, how will you go to make uh, that X, like my sine and my cosine have different frequencies instead of having just one that looks like a zoom in? If one, if one function, my sine will have a frequency and my cosine will have another frequency. How will you go uh, with to that? For example, yeah, that's an interesting one. One minus frequency, so you have a different thing with the same uh, variable. Another thing you can do. And I'm starting to see uh, artifacts. So what I'm going to do before that is uh, selecting my top. And in common, I'm going to change the resolution. It's very low. So I'm going to make 1K, 1024 by 1024. That looks a little bit crispier. Yeah? So that was a good one. One minus frequency, for example. We have already that frequency um, variable there, uniform in this case. So we can just use that one but they are still going to be related to each other. Another way to go would be to change a frequency from a float to two floats. So what I can do is convert it into a vector two. So I have two floats packed into one variable. And now is everything going to break, of course, but we just um, change it. So now frequency has two values. We can access them by typing dot what? Dot what? Dot x or y, dot x, dot, sorry, dot r and dot g, dot, yeah, because it's the same. It's an array, yeah. So you can also do like we did before, uh, sorry, zero. That will be the same as dot x. And don't be uh, fooled by that. It's dot x and y. It's just accessing the value. We can use it wherever we want. We don't have to use it to to drive anything in x. So now we have it. But in our vectors, only we are using x. In our uniform con frequency, y is zero. So this frequency here, the second one, my cosine, is um, I'm going to delete the one minus. So it's uv dot y times pi times zero right now. But if I make this one bigger, then I have more and more lines there. Yeah. And then, yeah, there, frequency dot, dot x, oh, frequency dot x and frequency dot y. Uh, you can, yeah. And uh, I call the, um, the workshop, hey, uh, like, um, video synthesizer style, I, I wrote something like this because it looks very similar because at the end of the day with electronics, you're using the same. You have a set of um, mathematical uh, relationships between numbers, and what you have is the same as here. You have a sine, you have a consine, you have an oscillator, that's my cosine at the end of the day, it's an oscillator, and we can change the frequency of those voltages and then you get uh, pixels on the screen.
Ja? We, we made a change here. So before, what we had was one value coming from Touch Designer that was one float called frequency. So we had this one number here, the first one, um, and we were using it to drive our cosine and sine functions. But now we said, yeah, that value is applied to both my cosine and my sine. I want to change that and have one value to each. There's many ways to do that. One will be to declare um, uniform float frequency two, right? And now I have two floats to use. That's uh, totally val val um, valid, but other ways to, because these two values are related to each other, to declare it as a package of two floats in one name. So I call it vector two frequency, and then I just have to change and say which part or uh, which uh, value in the package I'm going to use. I can say dot x or dot r. I can say dot y or dot g, and it's the same thing. Is everybody there? Any questions so far? Uh, any of you start to see, but how will I do this? Or how will I just ask that, OK? If, you, if you, your mind is uh, still already like going further, just ask me, and we all go there. So for example, this um, LFO, maybe I can change it to, well, no. What I'm going to do is a random uh, noise chop. Right? You know that one? Of course. And I'm going to use it. Well, I'm going to time slice it. And then I'm going to use it to drive this second one. This second, um, wait a second. Don't, not, don't go that far yet. We're going to do a null. That's the way to do it. And the null is the one that I'm going to reference, OK? Time slice and noise is in the common tab. Why did I do that? Uh, because I want to put here in between a math and change the range from 0 to 1, because we were talking frequency to 0 to 20. So I have this, um, well, let's do 15 to 20, maybe. Do you see that one? So this value now, I'm going to change it from 15 to 20 based on a noise. So I have this squashy. Uh, no, I created uh, the same one. Now it's a vector 2. So I can, so I can use. Um, value x and value y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, you can put whatever number you feel like. I, I use 15 to, to, to 20, but anything 0 to 1 to 15 to 20, yeah. It's 
Say it again. Uh, there's many ways to do that. I time slice it in. So in common, you have the time slice. Another way will be to to do um, the common apps time apps time dot frames. Uh, sorry. Dot frame. That will be another way to animate it. Do you want to make a little pause and go for a um, yeah coffee, uh, fresh air, whatever you like? Yeah, it's a good moment. Yeah, I'm going to leave it there so you can say and do welcome back and <clears throat> let's do two things. We are going to rewrite this one. Uh, a little bit, so reorganize, sorry, not rewrite, reorganize the code, so it's less um, going how, like with the, what we did, uh, was going just straight, and then we're going to close it and start a new exercise, okay? Yeah. To Sublime, you can um, uh, select your that and then um, right mouse, edit contents, or control E, command E. But if you are in the last um, version, I uh, don't recommend because it's a little uh, thing that gets disconnected. So there's a patch coming in a couple of days and that will solve that. So right now, it's better if you guys use the, um, the, ta uh, the dat itself to write the code. Um, okay, so let's rewrite this thing. What I'm going to do is make clear the part of the color because uh, right now it's a little bit um, involved here, as you see. So we are going to make that a little bit more understandable. So I'm going to declare again my color and I'm going to say, I'm going to set it to zero to start with. Um, yeah, the, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, I'm going to close this for a second and let's focus on. So let's say we want our color to be zero, zero, and one for alpha, right? Now we have the same. We just said vector, uh, my color is going to be black. And then, next line, I'm assigning what I had before, right? Nothing changed. We just add a new line for initialization. But one way we can go is say color dot red is going to be equals to what I wrote before. That was this. I'm going to copy paste. Color dot green is going to be equal to uh, what is it? Yeah, one minus what I wrote before. And my color dot blue is going to be equal to my cosine. So now I can take out this line. Everything stays the same. It's another way of writing it. It's another way of writing the same code but it's a little bit more legible. It's a little bit more clear what I'm doing. So I'm saying that color, if I don't change any of the values, is going to be black, 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 and alpha is going to be full. But then I'm changing the red. I'm going to assign to the red channel my sine and my cosine. I divided my, my cosine to the green channel, this expression here, and to the blue channel, this other one expression. Same thing, we are just taking advantage of this swizzling that we have to make our code more understandable. Yeah? It's the same as writing this. 
uh, actually how it was before, there was this, is this, ah, the same as writing that in one line where you see now four, but it's more, it's easier to grasp. Okay. Okay, so let's save that. Uh, save, yeah. And let's start a new one. Yep. I'm going to share, I have your email, so I'm going to share this with you afterwards. I didn't do it before because I like you to focus here, not, yeah. Somehow when you have the files, it's like you relax a little bit, right? It's like, yeah, I can check later, no. Yeah, you will be all right. Okay. Um, so did I save? Yeah, save. I'm going to make a new one. So these are my exercises that I plan, and we are here. So there's a lot to cover, but we're going to go, we're going to, sh yeah, we manage, don't worry. So same thing, we have a new project, it's empty. I'm going to add a GLSL top, and we are back to square one, right? This is what we had before. A color that is going to be my output, right? And right now it's um, color as white. So all the pixels are white. First thing I like to do is to rearrange my coordinate system to my liking. That's v u v dot st times two minus up oh, minus one. That's um. Uh, sorry, if I don't like the type, yeah. We are not using it yet, but I like to have it there, always handy. Right? So uh, we saw a couple of functions right now. We saw the absolute of a value. So that's just not taking into account the sign, meaning the negative side, it will be the same as the positive side of the value. So minus two becomes two. That's the absolute. We saw it before. Then we have the sign that will give you the sign function of, um, of a value. We saw the cosine. Same thing. We're going to take a look, uh, look at distance. So we're going to declare, uh, wait a second. We're going to do first what we did before. So tell my uh, color to be zero at initialization and then we are recolorizing there, okay? And full alpha. And here, we're going to draw our shapes. And here, up. Oh. Here, our shapes. And here, our, well, yeah. Coloring or whatever. Right? So right now, we have black, but solid, because alpha is 1. So we're going to write one. Um, very useful function that is the distance. Uh, yeah, so float this. Uh, we're going to call it dist. Yeah, a short for distance, and this is going to be the distance of two points. Right? It's going to tell me how far this point is from another point. So we're going to check. how far the actual pixel that we are talking about, because we're in a loop, right? We are writing for one pixel instructions, but they get executed for all of them at the same time. So we are just writing for one, but then gets um, extended to all of them. So we're going to check my pixel position that's my UV in that moment. 
how far is from the origin of the origin of coordinates so vec2 0 did I type 0 that's my origin okay so how far my pixel is from the origin if we think about it we move the origin to have zero here right so the distance will be to this point it's going to give me zero because I'm the origin so there's no distance distance is zero and the farther I go that value is going to increase meaning this corner over here will have the biggest value of all the screen well this one this one and this one right let's take a look so now I can say that color dot r equals uh, this right does it make sense what are you seeing we're telling this pixel has a UV value, meaning has a position on the texture, on the screen. I'm going to compare that position to the center of the origin, to the origin of the coordinate system, and calculating how far I am from it. Right? So now I have a gradient that is a circular gradient that goes from zero in the center, meaning no distance to the origin, to some value on the corners that is the max amount of um, distance. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, if I take that out, the gradient is circular, but to that corner. So now we have our zero in the, uh, in the center. That's why also before the zooming effect was coming from the center and not from the corner. That's already pretty cool, but that comes because we want to use um, another function that is also pretty common. This is a step function. The naming is not very uh, fortunate, but yeah. Um, so we say we are going to declare another variable that's going to be the step, oh, step, man, step this, and it's going to be the step function of. my distance, well, I have to say a uh, threshold first and then of which value. So what um, step this does is, <laughs> this is the worst word, yeah, whatever. We have a value, for example, um, a gradient. And now we say that at the threshold of 0.5, we're going to cut that value in two. So we're going to have now a step that's going to be zero and then one at that point, 0 0.5, okay? Let's come back. So if we use that one instead of this, or let's maybe try something I haven't tried before. Uh, let's use it in the blue channel. So we can see both at the same time. You see what's happening? If I take out the red, what I have is my gradient cut it in two. So it's a step function that is useful for many things. One of them is this one. It's like masking, like making values cut it in a threshold. So I say 0 0.5, but if I say 0.75 at 
the point where the value hits 0 0.75, I'm going to change from 0 to 1. So I have a sharp edge uh, shape right now. Right? I'm going to take out the red for a second so we see it clearly. What it's doing is taking my gradient, my distance, and doing a cut and saying before, before when the distance is less than 0 0.5, give me black. When the di 0, sorry. When the distance is bigger than 0 0.5, give me 1. Right? So it's a mask that we can use. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's a very good question. The one I use is Shaderific. Do I have internet? Uh, something's funny, but can you, you cannot read, right? Sh Shaderific, Shaderific. Yeah, dot com. I mean, Kronos is the actual Kronos group is the one that is taking care of OpenGL. So that's the one that has the actual um, uh, reference for GLSL. But Shaderific, I don't know what's going on. Not working for you guys? All right. That's funny, I checked two days ago. So maybe it's the um, maybe it's the Wi Fi that has some maybe it's block, but yeah, shaderific. If not, you can go to Kronos group. How uh question for you guys. Um how will you do the um, other way around? Now we have blue outside of is down okay interesting how will you go to do the opposite of what we have in the screen the blue inside um, 0 0.5 and black outside 0 0.5 mm -hmm. that's one way yeah yes so one minus distance will be flipping. So what zero, one minus, right? One minus zero, one minus zero. I'm getting lost. <laughs> zero minus zero is ah, one minus zero, one. One minus one, zero. Whatever. The other way around. I'm having a jet lag attack right now. <laughs> so it flips. So that's one way of making um, circles, for example. So now we have this um, 0 0.5 that we can take out of my shader if I declare a uniform float radius. Right, as we did before, I, in my vector one, I declare that radius with the same exact wording, and I use it now, it's declared, now I have to use it. I use it in my step dist, instead of 0 0.5, I say radius. Now changing here this value, it would make my circle go bigger or smaller. Do you remember where we started from? It started from. That was this. Um, this gradient. We had a gradient. Now we are cutting it. Somehow we are masking it, and using some parts of it. So what we are actually doing is re is creating a new. Um, um, coordinate system somehow. 
similar to a polar. It's not the same, but it's going in that direction. And now we can use that. Of course, all of you have seen the edges, that pixelation, because that's a hard cut that we're doing. There's a way to avoid that because there's a new function that is the smooth step. So if we call, we decla declare a new variable, we are going to call it smooth dist, and it's going to be the smooth step. Is it like that? I don't know. And maybe, and it takes two values now. So before we just gave one value, that was the threshold. At this point, cut it. Now we're going to give two values. Cut between this and that point. And in between, make a small or big um, linear interpolation. So a gradient. So if we say radius minus 0 0.01 and radius plus 0 0.01 of this. Let me see if that breaks. Yeah. What am I writing wrong? Mm. Uh, that's correct. Radius. Is it smooth step? Yeah. So, 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 undefined, undefined variable smooth step. One second. I'm writing something wrong, but then I think it's this function is called different. One sec. Smooth step. Oh, it's not camel case, sorry. My bad. Smooth step. All all small letters. And then we are going to use that one instead of our step dist for the, oh well, we can use that one for the green channel now that we're using that methodology. Yeah? Same thing is if we say one minus this, we have the opposite. And now you see the edges are sharpened. Ah, sorry, softer. Yeah? How will you go <clears throat> now? So this technique, by the way, is called uh, sign, sign distance functions. So we are declaring shapes based on the distance of one point to another. And that was happening uh, here, right? So I will have, we have our dist from UV, so from the pixel to zero. How will you go to move that circle to another position instead of being in the center of the image if if you want to move it around how would you go with about that that's one way try yeah that's one way you can change your uv to something else so you can move your whole coordinate system but there's another way because we said here that we are checking our distance 
to zero to the origin. But what if we check against another position, zero five? So we are checking how far I am from zero five zero five. That's like that quadrant. What about um, zero five in X, zero in Y? Do you see? Yeah. And that's a very useful technique that you will use later on for ray marching, ray tracing, and all of that. Because you need to know positions in space based on, on a distance. So what you're doing uh, is going away of that idea of having a circle or a sphere with vertices on, on space. What you're doing is checking the space. Does it, that, that make sense? So you're moving the space. Yeah. You're moving the your coordinate system, your space around, and then you're checking against that. Um, yeah, we can do that one. Another idea now. We have a, a solid uh, circle. If we want to draw just the outline, if we want to draw just a thin uh, ring instead of the whole circle, how will you do? There's many ways, of course. There's not just one way of doing things here. There's many ways of doing the same thing. Yeah. Two steps, for example. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes, that will be one. So you draw one circle, you draw a smaller circle, and then you rest, uh, you subtract one from the other. That will be one way. And if you relate the uh, radius to each other, then you can also scale, right? Let's do that. So we have smoothed this. We're going to do float, um, how will you call it? Um, inner, inner circle. And that's going to be the smooth step function of, yeah. let's say the same thing. But we're going to make our radius. No, let's leave that the same. But then radius will be multiplied by 0, 09, for example. That means whatever our uh, radius is, this one is going to be a little bit smaller. And then in green, we're going to say that smooth this, that the green channel, sorry, is equal to smooth this. This is unfortunate name, so that minus that one. And that was happening. Should we get this one out? That's the same. So one minus, and then that's multiplied. What? So what were we doing here? Let me check just this one.
So what is happening, or what happened before, is that I was subtracting the smaller from the bigger. So I didn't have it right. Because, yeah, we're in distance, so it's the opposite. Um, times zero nine is bigger than times one. Questions here, because I did a couple of steps without uh, saying what I'm doing. What I went with was copying the same um, as we had before. My idea was copying, uh, making another circle, making it a little bit smaller, and then uh, resting one from the other. My issue was I did, I did it in the other direction. Instead of smaller, I make it, I made it bigger. And if we say from the origin, now we have that shape. Let's animate it to make it a little bit, no? So, LFO, smaller period, amplitude is okay, and that to the radius. Yeah? Uh, you have to use it. Uh, look at here, this area. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, yeah, now it's easier to see. Yep. You got that one? <clears throat> yep. The relationship between the radius of the big one and the radius of the small one. Right now we have a, a multiplication, so that's a linear uh, relationship between them. And that's what is happening here. So it gets to the point that disappears, and then here it's really thick. You can make different relationships. There's actually one of the examples that I had. I will I will put it. Um, I will send it to you later. Um, with the derivatives, but this is a little bit more involved. I mean, I'm going to show it to you right now, so you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> If it uh, when it opens, so what I'm doing here is making my own st a smooth step function with the derivatives of um, x and y. These are functions that are given to you by um, um, GLSL and that you can use. So in this way, this is a, um, another smooth step um, function that is anti-aliased as well. So this is my own thing that you can use. And then I'm using that one instead of, um, so I'm just giving a radius and then it's anti-aliased by itself. I'm going to send you this file so you don't have to take care.
what is what is the question again to add yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly yeah what we went with was uh to make a um, relation between those two circles but you can also make this radius uh, uniform and then you control them separately that's what you have in the torus for example you have the radius and then you have also the inner radius so you will control by yourself the size or the width of this uh, circumference questions are you with me Let's do one more shape. That will be the square, because that's um, very common and very useful. And then we make something fun. Because I know, again, this is dry. Uh, this open, yeah. I'm just going to copy the important part. That is this. And I broke. Why did it break? Okay, so what I did, um, I had my... Um, exercise prepared, but we're going to go without taking too much uh, detail into the um, anti-aliasing. We're, we're going to make another shape. I call this this tense square. And um, it's a simple one. It's the max... There is another function given by GLSL, the maximum between X or Y. And we can use that one for, I don't know, the B again. Oh, mean square. Sorry, not the D square, the square itself. And if I take those out. Now what we have is another distance um, of the pixel to, so it's a shape, it's a, it's, a, it's a field at the end of the day. So we have an, a field that is in the shape of, um, that we can use to shape a square. For example, if instead of uh, just um, showing the distance function, the max, we do our step function here, step zero five square, then we have what we had before. We're just co cutting that gradient. Have you seen that one? So we had the gradient, but then if we do the step to it, then we have the square. Yeah, and if we do uh, one minus the square, we have the other way around. Yeah? So that's how you draw square. If you do, instead of step, smooth step, then you have an anti alice or a smooth uh, version of it. And now, um, 
this one here will be to animate the circle and then you can animate the square here as well. Where was our circle? Yeah. Did you get that one? So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say here, what, what I'm trying to show you is how to use the functions that are there to draw with them. Those functions are purely mathematical formulas that they don't mean, they're not meant in any way, but this is one of the uses of them is to draw stuff on the screen. Yeah, let's save that one. Where did I save? Yeah. One question, what will happen if I do this? Um, UV times two. Can you think about it bef before typing it? Like we did it before as well. A multiplication is, at the end of the day, a scale. So you're making your range bigger. So if I multiply times two, my range is bigger. Now to reach the end of the range, I need instead of the value one, I need the value two. So my things get smaller. If I multiply by zero five, I get the opposite. My range gets smaller. So that's a zoom. Now I can also do a um, offset. I will move the whole thing. Times one. I move all my coordinates, everything I'm drawing, it will be shift. So this is an offset. So this, this is the important thing about this workshop. You have to make a little change in your mind to think mathematically, to think that in order to move or to scale things, what I have to do is multiply. When I'm talking about UVs or uh, coordinates, if I'm talking multiply with colors, that's another thing, but it's um, the same as you have in Photoshop. When you multiply, whatever is black becomes black because zero times something is always zero. Yeah. So when you're defining the zoom or the offset, will you be times equals the same as basically saying UV equals zero? Or you have to yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a C way of writing, yeah. And of course, that can be done independently for X and Y, because UV is a two vectors package, but we are multiplying it for one value, uh, times one value, so at the end it's both at the same time, but you can stretch in one direction or the other. Um, yeah, take that out, maybe. Take the zoom out to touch designer. Make, uh, declare a, a uniform and then you can use the zoom from, from upside before I do it. Declaring a uniform to take our zoom that is now times two to a variable that we can change from touch designer. Yes. Because we are moving it at the same time in X and Y so then it moves 
in diagonal if you want to yeah yeah uh, for example how I'm doing right now for the zoom I'm declaring a vec 2 instead of a float is two values pack and then I'm using that vec 2 to multiply the zoom so now if I go to my uh, uniform I declare zoom I can now stretch um, in y, in x, sorry, differently than in y. And if I declare now an offset and do the same inside my shader and say uniform back to offset and then I use it here, copy and paste so I know that I'm okay with that. Now my offset zero in X, but in Y I can move everything. I'll show the code. But take into account that we are doing this for, well, no, not really. We're using uh, one coordinate system for everything. That doesn't have to be the case. Because uh, as you see, UV here is something I declare myself. So I can create many uh, coordinate systems and apply different coordinates for different parts of my shader. So I can move uh, the square independently from the circle if I would like to. That's something you do in ray marching a lot, for example. Because in ray marching, you, you deform the space, but you don't want to deform for everything. So you make copies of your uh, coordinate system and then you change them independently. You have now vec to UV, so you declare a new one, vec to UV, UV1, UV2, or you call it ST, or you call it however you want, and then change that one. Yeah. Uh, how will you do, for example, or oh, let's do it, let's do it. We have, um, I'm going to take out the green, so we are focusing on the blue channel. Uh, so we have a, this square, right? And it's solid, but actually this was really interesting because there's a gradient. So I want to select the square that I had before, but I want to draw inside of it this part of the image. So now I have two things separately, how do I combine them? That's my question. So one way to go is to multiply, right? And now we are talking what we I just said before in color space. So multiply two colors, the, the black part, what did I say? Multiply, oh wow, man. When you multiply colors, the black is, it means zero. So whatever is black, it will be zero out, whatever is white will be uh, the, other the other side of the, the same as in Photoshop. Or we can do, uh, our very good friend, one minus. You don't see in the projector, but you're doing it and you see the that looks like a pyramid, right? Yeah. 
So what I'm doing is uh, that square that was a zero, one value, use it as a mask to draw another shape. That was our nice gradient that we had already there. So it's free to use. Are you guys there? Mm, check the um, the info that to see what what is saying. In, is that one over there on the side? Undefined. So you have to define zoom here up. I made an uniform. Yeah. If you take a look at the screen, this guy is there. Yeah. All good. Well, that, that's what, how we wanted it, because of the absolute, and then we're doing the dot, right? Are we doing the dot? No, the max of either, so which value is uh, higher, the x or the y? So instead of a circle, we're just cutting with uh, whichever is uh, higher. We have one hour. Um, we're going to do noise, of course, and then we mix it up everything and we do something funky, okay? Does it sound good for everybody? Yeah? Okay. Sounds good. Yoo-hoo! <laughs> All right, save it. And let's do a new one. Yeah, that's also fine, yeah. Yeah, how, however you like to work, uh, to make a new project in the same file is also fine. Like however you, or a new component, <laughs> whatever you like. So, um, same thing, I'm going to uh, add the top, GLSL. And now I'm going to also add a null. So I can see, I have two times the same. So you can see one on the left while I'm coding. Taking this one out. First thing I do always is declaring my coordinate space. UV equals to V UV dot ST times two minus min minus one. All right. And then I'm going to say that my color is black solid. Okay. So, the same as uh, before, vuv.st is given by touch designer. Sinus, uh, sign of something was given by uh, GLSL. There's sorts of functions that are given to us by Touch Designer. So there's some functions that we can use. So for example, um, if we go to derivative, um, writing GLSL, there's this, um, write a GLSL top, um, reference where we have um, information. So for example, how to sample an image, a texture is here, no? And then there's this one, samplers, built-in samplers, uniform, built-in uniforms, that's the one. Uh, where is it? VUV is there, semi cancer, and then built-in functions. TD output swizzle, that was here all the time. We didn't take uh, too much attention to it because it was already given. That's something uh, that designer does in the background to um, make sure that in Mac and in PC, we see the same thing, right? So we don't have to take care of it. That's just given, just use it. 
But then we have these guys that are really nice. D3, for example, is also good. It adds a little bit of noise to the image. But one of my favorites, Perly Noise. That's the, um, you remember the beginning I was talking to that guy that won an Oscar with an algorithm? That's Ken Perlin. He, the algorithm is really well known. It's Perlin Noise, named after him. So we can use that one. So we say that my float, I just copied paste. So float noise equals Perlin noise. Um, and I have to give it a position. So it asks where do I need to create the noise from where? It's the same as the sign. We were given a value and it gave us back another value, right? Same with the um, Perlin noise. So we ask for a value of the noise at position UV. And now if we draw that, color.r equals noise. You get that. We can make, we can make, we can zoom in, right? You remember how was that? Well, yeah, zoom out, sorry. If I make my UVs, so my position, my range bigger, it's effectively zooming out. And I see more parts of the noise. If I do 20, So that's, if you think about it, kind of in the same direction of what we did before with the frequency of the sign, right? We're just expanding the range. You remember when I draw the sign and then I said, we're seeing this, how do we get to the whole, same thing. And then we can animate it, of course many ways of animating uh, something like this. I will go with the uniform route. So if I declare a uniform float called time, I can go up to my shader, to my top, sorry, declare time and give it the value of the frame that we are at. Right? So now I have a variable, a uniform. Are you following me, everybody? I'm going too fast. I declare uh, a new uniform, the same as before. Went up to my top, and I gave it the Python expression absolute time dot frame. So it gets the value of the frame, total frame that we are at. So now I have inside my shader a number that is constantly changing, nonstop, and that I can use to drive animations. For example, offsetting, take a look here, offsetting, I'm not calling this adding anymore, offsetting my noise, scaling my noise, offsetting my noise. Way too fast. So let's change this to times. Still too fast. Yay! Um, it's still too fast. I'm getting dizzy. Who can tell me why it's moving in diagonal? At the same time, exactly. We're moving in X and Y. We're using a scalar value, a float, to change um, vector to. So we're offsetting both X and Y at the same time. So I can go many ways right now. One, 
will be to say that this is not a um, float, it's a vector to which x is zero and which y is time. So now I'm just moving up from top to bottom, yeah? Doesn't work? Um, TD Berlin noise. That's correct. But color R equals noise. Yeah. yeah? Nice, 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 nice. So, for example, what they've been doing here is also changing the zoom to a non uh, constant, constant zoom in X and Y. So, for example, if my zoom in X is 20, but my zoom in Y is 1, uh, what did I break? Back to I have something totally different. So with the just two tricks that we know by now, that this scaling, offsetting, and using the functions that are there, we can get really nice results. Let's do. Um, yeah, another noise for the blue channel. I'm going to use this time instead of Perlin, another kind of noise is simplex noise. And I'm going to leave the rest the same. Noise one, noise two, very lame, I know. So color B equals Noise two. Or I'm having an idea, actually. I'm going to, that's cool, but I'm going to use Berlin, the same one, but to time. I'm going to add a little, little, little offset. Do you see? Well, uh, you don't really see. But uh, if you try it on your machine, you will see that we are having now, instead of uh, two shapes that were, we have one that looks that shifts a little bit in color. And if we do the same for um, green, you'll see something familiar. Noise three, zero, minus 0 0.1. And then I call color green equals noise three. Do oh my god zero zero five and I'm going to change this is two and this is three uh no I'm going to do this is one this is two yes Doesn't matter how you combine them. The idea now is to drive one, um, three noises as one shape and offset the colors.
Okay, cool. Do you want to play around a little bit with this one? Um, like, yay! <laughs> I will go with adding some random uniforms here and then placing them around like scale noise one, scale noise two, scale noise three. That will go with a vector three scale and then use X here, Y, or maybe you want to use vector two for uh, scale one, vector two for, scale, for offset one, that direction. Just play around a little bit. Yeah, that's that's a good one. That's a good question. To make rotations, that's a uh, that involves uh, more math <laughs> than what we have. One way uh, is to use polar coordinates that I I want to explain. Another way is uh, to use what I do all the time, this take the function already written. Uh, it has to do with um, changing the sine and the cosine of the... Um, so rotating around, basically. So uh, GLSL rotate, you will get um, rotation 2D, that, that's a good one. So we this we didn't do yet. So actually, it's a good uh, thing to do. We can declare another functions that is not main. So for example, we can uh, declare this rotate function. I will I will share the link where I got it from, which is doing a matrix two by two, and then getting in that matrix the sign. Um, of the angle and then uh, multiplying that matrix by the uh, position, right? You don't really need to know exactly how it works. I mean, you can, of course, but uh, some of these, uh, for example, the normal calculation is also one function that um, you just use it. It's there, it hasn't changed for a few years and it's how it is. So you just copy paste and you use it. This is another one of those. The rotation is um, there. So now we can we can use it. So we can say UV equals ah equals rotate UV. What am I rotating and how much? My degrees. I don't know if it. I think, yeah. That's in degrees, yeah. If you want to do it in zero to one, you have to um, multiply, but. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. Touch designer, for example, is one. <laughs> no. Um, GLSLify is one, but that's for JavaScript with NPM and all the stuff. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what I have is these all these functions I have myself in in files that then I can just import. Yeah, you just built it yourself through time. For example, I don't call TD Perlin noise uh, directly. I have my own that has three inputs: um, scale, offset, and position. Yeah. Like, let's do that one for example, as an example. So you, you can declare your own noise. For example, let's say uh, float. We are going to declare a function here, okay? Do you see? Uh, 
outside the main, as we just copy the rotate, we're going to do our own function. So I'm going to call it my noise. It takes as an input three values. That is uh, vector two p for position. Flow, uh, sorry, vector two um, scale and vector two offset. Right, and it gives me out or returns a value that has to be a float. And this is going to be similar to what we wrote before. I'm just copy and paste this. TD noise, UV now is called P, right? Is this one? Times scale plus offset. So I'm just wrapping around my um, the function that I had before, and now I have it written as just one uh, simpler call, but it's basically the same. So if I do it um, here back, noise one equals my noise UV and then big to 20 comma big to zero time. That's right now exactly the same thing. Doesn't make much sense because we're not doing anything different, but you can do uh, crazy stuff here inside. If you would like to, for example, I don't know, the scale is going to be already multiply. I don't know how this thing is going to look like, but yeah. Already multiplied by the offset. So we have that. Doesn't make any sense, but you get the idea. So you can declare your own functions and use them separately. One nice thing, actually, in the last versions of uh, Touch is that you can create your own um, uh, text file and move these functions there, for example. Let's copy. I'm going to copy all of this here. And this is going to be called, I don't know, utils, right? So I have a text that, this is a text, text that, that I can externalize, I can save as a file, that is going to, oh, that is going to hold some um, functions. And now, instead of having this here, I can call um, include, Utils. And it broke. Wait a second. Syntax error include. Mm -hmm. One second. So you can create your own library. That's what we're doing right here. So you, you have all these functions that you found around and you like and you create yourself. You can save them in files. Ah, the, hmm, man. Include utils. What that means is this, all this code that is in this uh, that will be paste instead of this line internally. So it's like having all this code here. And now you can use all those functions. So you just save 
those functions for, to yourself as an external file, and th then just copying this one and making the include, you will have them, which is pretty, pretty uh, good. That was um, coming from the last summit in Berlin in 2018. Someone from the audience asked Greg, how nice would it be to have an include in shaders? And like two days later, we had it. It was really, really nice. Right now it's here, you can save it as file. It's a, yeah, it's a text, um, that, and you can save it here, yeah. yeah. Yes. Sorry? Yeah, you can just save as an external file and then put it in. And wait, 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 sorry. The question is include all the path here? No, here that's the um, operator name. But the file is somewhere else, the operator is here. The operator um, text will be connected to an external file but the operator itself is here. Um, inside the shader, you just reference the name of the operator, but your operator will have a reference to a file. It's two steps, right? Ah, okay, I follow you. Yeah, uh, select. No. <laughs> that would be the easiest, yeah. Yeah, 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 you can do masks there, yeah. For example, if we say here color.a equals noise one or whatever, then we have alpha. It's not a solid anymore, you can compose it with that, yeah. Yes. So, oh? A non directive. One second, I'm coming. Uh, I'm going to save this and my card. Okay. Um, we're going to try uh, one thing. Let me know if it's too much, but um, I want to show you this one trick because it's very important. I mean, very important. It's nice to have. So um, we made different things to our UV, right? One that we didn't do was to replicate. So we are working always with one space, but we can have many spaces. So for example, uh, what I will do is to make uh, multiplied by four, and then say that my UV is only the fractional part of my UV. And now, uh, wait a second, I'm going to not uh, rotate, where I have is many copies of the same thing, so I'm tiling my UVs times two, do you see what's happening? Yes.
I can also say that my UV to be only the floor part of the UV. Essentially, oh well, uh, I'm going to have an issue there, yeah. Yeah, not in this way, but yeah. So what I'm doing, and what is interesting here, is uh, dividing my space, or I mean multiplying it, and then taking, not taking into account if it's two, three, four only from zero to one of those, meaning zero, zero, five, one, the next one will be 1.52, but if I, if I use fract, then I have 05, 05, 05, 05, 05, 05. So I'm repeating my um, coordinates, so I can, do, I can do this trick, have many, many copies of the same um, image inside my texture. And then with that, you can do really nice tricks. I'm going to save this one as four and then, because we are running out of time, I'm going to show you what you can do and then we play for 20 minutes with the thing, okay? Uh, save as four. Nice, yeah, really cool. So, what I did here, um, you remember the at the beginning we were doing circles, squares, that shapes. There's one um, that we uh, that we jump that is a generalized uh, formula that I call polygon where you define the number of sides. So you can say, um, where am I? Sides is a uniform. So I can say three sides, four sides, five. You get the point, right? If I do 60, then I have a circle. And then, I'm using that technique of dividing, of tiling um, the UVs. And then uh, here down in my rotate tile um, formula, I'm using an index that I get from a step function. Basically what I'm doing is for every uh, new uh, UV section, I'm assigning an uh, index that then I can use to drive a rotation, for example. So each of them will have a different rotation. So if I say now, if I change my amount to whatever, doesn't matter because um, we are not taking we are not thinking about shapes itself, so it doesn't matter how many shapes, it's, it's the same cost of calculation. And then I can add uh, offset to that rotation, so all of them will rotate differently, that kind of thing. I'll send you this file as well with the polygon so you have it. And let's play then around with the thing. Or questions? Maybe? Mm. In the previous one? Yeah, the angles I was giving, I was changing them based on on the index. So there's a rotate to D and then 
for every new part gets rotated. So for example here, what I can do is this angle, bring it out and make a uniform float angle and use it here. Angle times 360. And now this angle is up there for me to use. For example, by an LFO. Yes. How would you do a mirror tie as opposed to the tie on the that would just have to be a Hmm. Um, well, you can use the modulo to select every second tile and then on those invert um, the angle yeah yeah or one minus UV that will be even easier yeah with the modulo every second iteration yeah all the way That's too intense. Uh, questions or anything you want to know because we have some time but just to experiment but if you have any questions mm -hmm. um. I don't know if you've seen my Instagram, I did like one year, last year, 2018, every day I did a shader just to exercise a little bit and get faster. So you can see already some of the techniques that we talk here, like this offsetting of colors, for example. Does it play? Wow, it doesn't play externally, but it plays on my laptop. That's funny. Um, yeah. Some noise functions. This one is really nice. Same thing you cannot see. Sorry. Um, about my approach to shaders. I mean, there was some stuff I, uh, I interiorized that were not there before. I had to think now I don't have to think about them anymore. I, I just, like the POW function, I have to always wrap my hand around. And now it's like, boom. Um, but what I learned the most, I think it was at a personal level, like how hard it is to commit to something for a full year every day. <laughs> Yeah, really. It's, it, I think that was the the big in, the inside about it. Yeah. 
because there's many things happening to a person in one year. You break up, you go for holidays, you get drunk one night without planning it, and you know. And it's like, fuck. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Some of them, yeah. I think, uh, I, I think you can tell uh, at some point. Like, I don't remember where, but yeah. Like this guy, I mean, come on. <laughs> no, but it was cool. And I learned a lot. Like, um, yeah. And then another, it doesn't move there, but yeah. Another thing I did that um, was really interesting with these shaders was train uh, neural networks with uh, frames for, from those shaders. So then the, the generative adversarial will make new frames for me. That was also super nice because, um, yeah, dogs and cats are always good. But yeah, if you can produce your own images to train, then not much. Um, I'll say 3,000 or something like this. Not much. Yeah. I mean, the more, yeah, as always, the more you have, the better. But. And then, is any of you coming later to the other workshop today? Um, yeah, cool. So what we will be uh, seeing, if there's um, any energy left in my brain, will be um, this guy, for example, was made, uh, we made it in a shader. The shape um, is going to open. It's a ray marching shader, a fragment shader. Um, yep. So that was one of the first explorations we had, like with some reflections. Then we went simpler and we went to just the element and the parameters. They are animated, but then we decided to get uh, anonymous data from the ticket uh, selling and then put those parameters inside the shape. So it somehow it reflects us, somehow. So that's what we will be seeing later. And it's all, well, the green guy over there is, uh, is SOP. The rest is all pixel, pixel shader. <laughs> yes, I think everything will be online anyway, so. That's a funny one. If you see it's rotating, um, how, do you see how it rotates? It's not around zero. Is it? I know, yeah, it is, yeah. Yes. For example, you do what we said before. Now we can create another vector to uv2 that is equal to uh, the first uv and then rotate only that one. Oh, sorry. Rotate only that one. So now we have two uvs, one that is rotating, one that is not rotating. And we can use um, that one for the red channel. Uh, right? Am I right? Is it? Yeah. What am I doing wrong? Vector is uv2 equals uv, uv2, rotate uv2 by angle. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, my angle is um, in the uniform. But yeah, that would be the way, like to create, ah, because uh, it's this one actually. Um, so th that's what we were saying before. You can cre have many, um, you, you are not constrained to have only one coordinate system. You can create as many as you want, one based on zero in the corner, one based on zero in the center, and then treat them separately to create your shapes. That's funky. No. Questions anymore? Hmm. Well then, I hope you like it, you learn something, and you continue with shaders, I mean. There's a lot of information. Like, uh, if you didn't check it yet, the book of shaders from Patricio uh, Gonzalez Vivo is a very good resource. It's uh, unfinished, but there's a lot of stuff that you can, for example, fractional Brownian is another way of um, doing noise that is stacking different noise and then offsetting them in, a, in some ways. And you can create really good stuff. For example, uh, terrains are built in that way. Some nice motions are built in that way. This kind of um, dreamy, noisy thingy. Yeah. Yeah, like this one here, for example, you can just, or let's go to the other one that's simpler. Um, this one. You can just type something, and then you see immediately what it does. It's really, yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, really cool. That will, yeah, thanks to you guys, yeah.